Hello, this is Jeff. Hi. Can you hear me, Todd? Yes, I can. Perfect. I can't see anybody. Uh, let me see if my... Yeah, well, should see me now? Yes, sir. Yep. Perfect. And we got Justin. Uh, I thought yep, I saw David me? just a moment ago. Yep, I can hear you. David, can you hear us? I'm showing you're muted. Yep, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. We're still missing Dana. Nope, there's Dana. She's connecting now. And the Matt O'Brien. Can you hear me? So you've joined, but uh, yes, I can hear you, Dana. Perfect. And we've got Elliot, uh, Elliot Evans. Hi, Elliot. Hi, and then uh, Bill Inlaw sitting right by me too. Oh, he's with you. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right. Um, John. I know who Chris Kennison is. Alan Reese, I'm not sure. Is that one of the township trustees? I'm going to assume not then. The only names I got for township trustees that were joining tonight were uh, Elliot, just you and Bill. I'm not certain what's going on with the rest of them, but uh, it's. Shortly after seven now, we've got the zoning commission folks here and the two of the township trustees that I'm aware of. So I will go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, apologize for the technical glitch with uh, getting the meeting started this evening, but hopefully everything will go smoothly from here. Uh, Matt, can you hear us, Matt Duvay? Got you loud and clear, guys, make... thanks. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, I will call the uh, meeting to order. We have uh, all the commissioners here. So first on the agenda is approval of the agenda and minutes. Is there a motion to approve the agenda, agenda and minutes or any discussion? I'll move approval. For a second. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor, signify aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. The agenda and minutes are approved. Um, so next on the agenda is uh, <laughs> the introduction of the township trustee representatives. I had sent a letter to, um, uh, to all of the township clerks um, asking that they uh, have a township trustee from their township uh, join us this evening so we can talk through the uh, development plan uh, work that we have. I heard from three of the townships, uh, Bristol Township, we have uh, Elliot Evans that has joined us uh, as the township trustee representing Bristol and Brookfield Township, we have Bill Emlaw uh, representing Brookfield. I also heard from Silver Lake, uh, Silver Lake said that they would have no trustees um, uh, joining us this evening to um, uh, to work through the county de countywide development plan work. The rest of the townships were completely silent. I have no idea um, if um, if they're going to assign somebody or not. We will proceed with what we have. I'll reach out to those townships again um, and um, ask if they can identify somebody that can join us. Um, but otherwise, that was, um, I guess we just have the two of the township trustees. Um, we'll come back to that in just a moment. I do want to introduce a, um, a relatively new agenda item that was not um, originally planned. In, in December, we had planned this meeting uh, to talk to the development plan. 
in the meantime, uh, what has come up is let me share my screen real quick. Um, Where's my bear with me here? All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, it just shows more people. Yeah, now we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what has happened over the last couple of months, The um, and mostly just within the last couple of weeks, um, the supervisors have concluded um, through conversation with a variety of folks that the um, uh, wind ordinance would be better defended um, if there were a challenge to it, if the county had countywide zoning. So uh, they have asked us for recommendations. So. Um, we, you may recall in April of last year, when we first started work on the commercial wind ordinance, uh, one of our first questions was, do we want to approach countywide zoning at, at that time and, uh, and add commercial wind rules or pursue a separate wind ordinance? Uh, our zoning commission decision was to pursue the wind ordinance uh, then we would address the countywide development plan and then zoning. So this most recent um, information from the supervisors kind of um, turns that a little bit because the, uh, um, the wind ordinance is now essentially tabled pending decision on countywide zoning. So you should be aware that the ordinance, the countywide zoning ordinance was approved in 2009. It's limited to just Heartland, Brookfield and Danville townships. Um, so now they require a uh, recommendation from us. And so the broad steps as I see it is we need to have a discussion and vote on the work to make a proposal for countywide zoning. Um, and then we would need to go through and assign proposed zoning to the unzoned areas, um, assess the ordinance for any necessary changes with the idea being it's there, it's been in place for the most part, it shouldn't require any immediate changes for applicability to um, uh, these other townships. I don't know why my screen's going blank. All right, can you see it again? Can you still see my no. screen? No. 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 Yeah, it just it blacked out on me for a moment. I'm not sure why. Uh, so you should be able to see it now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, then we would um, notify the public, uh, publish the proposal, the zone assignments and hold public hearings, make any necessary changes and final vote, and then present recommendations to county supervisors. Um, so that's the situation with regard to uh, uh, item five on the agenda. Uh, <coughs> item, item six, is there really just to, you know, since this is just dropped on us, uh, well, dropped on you guys tonight, dropped on me just um, the other day, um, 
give you a chance to ask any questions. And then what I'd like to do is um, uh, just get a consensus from the, uh, from the zoning commissioners on do we go forward with this kind of a plan so that we can provide recommendations and ultimately a final vote uh, to the supervisors. Uh, there's a lot of work between now and that final vote and public hearings and so on, but I wanted to give you guys a chance to um, get updated on this and ask questions and decide if this is the approach we want to take. Well, just a comment, um, when it comes to countywide zoning, since there's so much, I don't want to call it resistance, but um, lack of knowledge of what zoning actually is, when we mm -hmm. go about this, there needs to be maybe a few statements sent out to the public of what zoning is and is not. Everybody's worried about infringing on their rights and, and telling them what to do, and they need some education basically saying, you know, that we're not here to take away anything. You're just here to, to safety things. You know, we don't care about what color your shutters are. You know what I mean? You know what I'm getting at, Jeff. Right. Yeah. Um, and to that point, Todd, and I've um, pulled up our shared drive. I have a um, larger document, a couple page document that spells out those five or six steps that I just discussed. I had on the screen a moment ago um these six steps um with a lot more discussion and uh, uh, uh an approach on how we could go about assigning those things and with that approach um we'd actually have a couple of public meetings um the first one would really be an informative public meeting saying that this is this is what's happening uh this is the the direction that we're going um, you know, if we if we look at the land today, um, you know, first of all, nothing would change in the three zone in the three uh, townships that are zoned. The rest of the land in the other nine townships, I think we would um, essentially apply first a blanket default. Everything is zoned ag just because of the nature of the county, with exception of those areas that we can identify are actually set up for um, industrial kinds of things like the scrap yards, um, uh, the gravel pits, things of that nature would have to be zoned uh, industrial. Um, churches, we would want to zone as R2. Uh, there's a lot of exempt land uh, in the county that uh, is used by state or county or federal folks. Uh, so we would have to hit those. Um, but that would just be an initial meeting, giving people a, a broad brush on what's happening and highlight to them, um, once again, the ag exemptions. Um, then we would go through uh, really the, the work of steps two and three, which are assigned proposed zoning to the unzoned areas. And I think, as I said, I think I've got an algorithm we can use to, to do that um, and then the ordinance. And then we would have another public hearing where we would notify the folks and actually we have to send a letter to every resident in the unzoned portions of the county, letting them know what's going on and, and what the proposed zoning would be uh, and then have that second public hearing. Would it be up to the public then to vote or just you guys or both on the rest no, of the county? So the way it, yeah, so the way it would work is the, the zoning commission is responsible for making the recommendations on what the zoning should be. Um, we get input from the public through public input, public hearings and so on, but ultimately, it's the zoning commission's responsibility to establish those recommendations. Then we provide those recommendations to the supervisors and then the supervisors, they hold public hearings 
and ultimately make a decision on what's going to be. You don't change any recommendations, so you just leave it up, up to the supervisors to change any recommendations? Well, we, make, we, we make the recommendations to the supervisors, and then it's up to the supervisors to decide whether they want to go with those recommendations or make changes. So the, super, the supervisors are the only ones that can um, make the decisions on what's going to happen. The zoning commission is just responsible for making the recommendations. So we do the legwork for them, give them the recommendations, and then it's kind of up to them. Basic document is all there. It's just the legwork of taking the county map. I'm having a hard time hearing you, David. Uh, sorry, I'll speak up. Um, you know, realistically, our work is to decide what areas that we're going to automatically change from being the default agriculture to non agriculture, right? I mean, that's basically what we got to do is is change the map. Yes. You know, and like you say, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. There's a bunch of the areas you can just, you know, it's uh, City of Manly's already zoned, what, two miles all the way around them? Yeah, the city, yeah, the city has claimed their two mile extraterritorial zone. Yep. Um, now, with the fact that there's no zoning um, in that township, there's no county zoning in that township. Um, I believe the supervisors still have to take, you know, they, they, the, the supervisors still have to decide if there's going to be zoning in that township. And then there's some discussion between the county supervisors and the city on how that extraterritorial zone um, washes out. But I, I believe what will happen is Manly will still have uh, the, the ability to claim that two mile extraterritorial zone. It's more, of, I think it's more of a formality than anything else just because there's no zoning now but when the county says, if the county says there, that township is zoned, then I think Manley has to reassert that extraterritorial zone. Hey, Jeff, I know in Winnebago County, we have what they call 2080 agreements, like with Forest City and Lake Mills. That's probably something we'd have to look at. Right. So any other discussion on uh, this plan of work that we have with regard to coming up with recommendations for the supervisors? How about like me and Bill then? What, what, what say do we have? Or what's our roles in yeah, this? So, yeah, so the, um, uh, for you and Bill, you guys are are on the meeting today, and and part of the work that we have, it's a second body of work that we've got going on, and that's dealing with the um, countywide development plan. Um, so if I back up here for a moment, um, the countywide development plan is a requirement per Iowa code. And the Iowa code says that if counties are going to manage development in their county, they have to have a development plan that lays out their goals and strategies for how they're going to manage that development. And then the zoning ordinance is the vehicle by which um, <clears throat> those plans are actually managed. Well, the county development plan that's in place today was drafted in 2005. And it was approved in 2006, and it's, it's had no changes since. So 
independent of what we just discussed with regard to expanding zoning in the county, the Zoning Commission looked at that development plan late last year and said, we need to update that plan. There, there's not been anything done with it for you know, quite a number of years. And so we developed a plan for how we were gonna do that update, which are the five steps that you can see on the screen here. Um, step one was update the first part of that county development plan that lays out the state of the county. Our population, you know, the, the nature of our demographics, uh, what kinds of activities we have going on in different parts of the county, what kind of land do we have in different parts of the county, et cetera. Um, and we're working with NICOG to do that. In fact, Matt O'Brien is on the call with us tonight. He's going to give us an update on that work. The second thing that we wanted to do, and this is where we wanted to um, uh, get some assistance uh, and input from the township trustees, is that 2006 plan had a lot of goals that it laid out. And we wanted to get broad input into how well the county has accomplished the goals in that plan over the last 15 years. And so our thought was we would create a separate, um, essentially a subcommittee of the zoning commission, which would contain of the zoning commission members and a representative from each of the townships, which is why we've invited you guys. Um, and so collectively, you guys and us would work on how do we go about assessing how well the county accomplished the goals, get input from as many people as we can, the county officials. Um, we talked about potentially doing uh, um, public surveys. Um, so we, we need to work through all that. And then once we got that input, then we would evaluate the results of that scoring, if you will. And we would evaluate what is the current state of the county today. And then we would draft or update the goals, new goals and strategies that are contained in that old plan, um, review that with the public, get public input on that, and then ultimately provide an updated countywide development plan to the supervisors uh, for them to consider and hopefully approve. And so that's, that's what the township trustees have been asked to participate in. And, and that's actually um, our uh, uh, next agenda item. I was gonna go into that a bit further, um, but I, I do wanna close with the zoning commission members on this plan for going forward with this countywide zoning consideration. So I guess the the easiest way uh, to do it is is there is there any opposition or dissent from the zoning commissioners on this broad approach of a plan for how we go about this task? So hearing none, um, again, there's a lot more detail uh, to this. And again, you can see that detail in um, if you go to our, our shared drive. Uh, how do I get back there? Um, so I created a new folder called zoning. And in that folder is a document that lays out in greater detail the proposed plan regarding countywide zoning. Um, what I'd like to do is submit that document to you guys for consideration and ask when is the next earliest time that we can get together as a zoning commission and um, uh, essentially agree on 
the uh, the approach that's outlined in there. It's essentially the Jeff. Have you got any any you more feedback here. from NICOG on the maps um, as far as pr for the proposed zoning? For the proposed zoning or state of the county? Proposed zoning, I believe. Proposed zoning, no. Um, okay. They're they're kind of waiting on us, uh, which again, I, I didn't want to drop all this on you guys tonight and then say, okay, here's how I think we can, here's the guidance I think we can give to NIACOG for creation of some initial maps for us to look at. Um, I wanted to give you guys some time to digest that and then we could have a discussion on it um which again i'll let me zoom this in a little bit so these are our current zoning classifications and you know a key is 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 here as far as an approach that i think that we can take um which again it's a default assignment of ag to everything with the following exceptions. And then it goes down and it, it lists out those exceptions. There's a lot to consider here. So um, I don't wanna get into it in great detail. I, I, I wanna give you guys a chance to read this and digest it and think about it. And then I'd like to come back uh, if we could uh, as early as next week go through and, and agree on an approach that we could then give to NICOG so they can create those maps. So it'd be considering this number two. So would the zoning commission members be able to meet as early as next week, you know, digest that document that I pointed out there and meet as early as next week to decide if that's the approach that we wanna to give to NICOG for creation of the maps. And we would also decide at that meeting when we wanna hold the first public meeting, letting folks know this is what's going on. anybody that would not be able to make a meeting next Wednesday. Is this weather permitting? Yeah. Okay. So we will plan on that. I'll create an agenda for that and get that agenda out to everybody um, tomorrow so that you can uh, have clear, uh, clear information there on what we're going to discuss and, and cover in that meeting. So that said, um, I want to turn back to um, Elliot and Bill. And once again, what we're going to shift back to now, which was the um, our original intent for the agenda, discussion on the countywide development plan update. So. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, call on Matt O'Brien and ask him to give us an update on what NICOG has with regard to the state of the county information. And for Elliot and Bill's uh, benefit, um, if you're not familiar with the countywide development plan, uh, there is a copy of it on the uh, on the county website. You also should have access to um, this uh, uh, Google Drive that has development plan um, information in it. Uh, and there is a copy of the current countywide development plan here. 
So, Matt O'Brien, um, are you there? I am ready when uh, you want me to go. Perfect. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I you will, could. Yep. So I'll do that here. There we go. So I don't know if all of you can uh, see the PowerPoint, but can most of you see it? Yes. Oh. Yep. That's good. First good step. So first off, I'll say uh, North Iowa Area Council of Governments is basically a regional planning agency, and we primarily provide technical assistance to uh, the 67 cities and eight counties in North Iowa, and North County is obviously one of those uh, counties. So uh, we are also like a glue between the state departments and federal agencies. So we do a lot of that, you know, just help the county staff and the city staff, you know, get their work done daily. So we do have a contract set with the Worth County Supervisors and basically whatever maps, uh, graphs, tables that Worth County wants, you as a PNZ, the uh, plan development subcommittee want before you make a recommendation to the supervisors that I will make that for you with you know, format it in whatever, you know, analysis or whatever way you want. And then basically assist the county as needed with drafting narratives. So my mindset is I'll just create a Word doc, plug some of the tables, maps already started on this presentation here, and then plug in Word doc and then add my thoughts, my, you know, interpretation of all the data and maps. And then you guys basically work from that, you know, decide your strategies, goals, and all that, have your discussions. And then you can, uh, once you're done with all that, you can send it back to me and I can review what you know you have created and then I can just give more recommendations. Then. On the county side, uh, basically on the county's plan draft, drafting the plan, just to make sure to have the uh, titles, figures uh, numbered and just decide what you want in the appendices, the body of document or leave out. Some maps you may want for me just for analysis purposes, not for actually putting in the plan. And some you may, or, you know, when you're zooming in on a township, you may want to have an appendix, appendices, appendix, and not in the actual, you know, body of the document. And then uh, basically talking to Jeff previously, we did talk briefly talk about the government revenue and expenditures information. So the county would obviously, you know, provide that to the Planning and Zoning Commission, Development Plan Committees, so you guys can see, you know, how the county budget is spent from year to year. So you compare, you know, the current year to past years. So then I uh, created a long list of data sources that I currently use, data sources the county can, we can use, you know, during this round of creating the plan. And then there's things the county can acknowledge in the plan uh, update, but you don't need to actually go through those, you know, extensively, exhaustively, and putting them in, all the information in the plan. We want to ultimately create a user-friendly document that public can understand. We want it to be Usually what I'm, I feel I'm told to have the document at a sixth to 10th grade reading level. We don't want to make this into a, you know, a doctoral you know, reading assignment. So I do have a long list of items there. So most of the information will be 2020 census gives us the numbers, uh, population counts and races does not give us much else information. They'll be giving us more of the age breakdown later in the year. But primarily we worked off the five-year estimates and that goes till 2019. The 2019 data was just released in November 2021. So it sounds like it's old, you know, it feels like 2019 was a long time ago, but it is the most recent data. And then, the, or that was released, uh, the population characteristics data was released in December 2020. And then the economics from the Census Bureau's uh, economic studies was released in November 2021. And then we can get a lot of information from Iowa State. The USDA has a lot. Uh, the Iowa Department of Transportation, Iowa DNR, the State Data Center of Iowa is the, really the uh, last resort for data, getting data. So if you guys ask me for information, I don't know where to get it from. I ask the State Data Center. Otherwise, I go directly to the stores. And usually it's easy for the, we have a lot of contacts at the state government. It's easy to talk to Iowa State or the state of Iowa, but otherwise uh, we'll use the State Data Center to obtain information from the federal government for us. <laughs> And then uh, based on the analysis level, Jeff and I talked about it briefly, but we'll analyze things on countywide. Preferably we want things done by townships, unincorporated areas, leave the cities out. But when you get into the 
the census of the uh, population characteristics estimates from 2010 to 2019, for the townships that do have a city within it, it does factor in the city and we cannot remove those population characteristics from that township. So if the township doesn't have a city within it, it'll just be that township, obviously, their, you know, all their details, uh, estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau. So most cases, uh, especially when it's land use, the uh, geographic information systems, my background's in uh, geographic information systems. We can, uh, you know, primarily just analyze on the unincorporated area townships, and then I briefly will talk about, uh, talk about later. But Iowa State Extension does have its summary. They had 2018, they have done the 2019 since that data just came out. But analyzing, you know, uh, what is the generic description of rural Iowa, and then we want to compare rural Worth County to rural Iowa. There's a lot of uh, opportunities and threats for rural Iowa. And then here's just some uh, random thoughts I have for long range planning. And you guys have talked about it, you know, over and over again. But you're basically looking for trends and providing explanations for anomalies and data. Sometimes you'll look at my data, my maps, like this looks very strange. I might have some little issues, you know, later in this presentation. But basically, that's usually because of data collection methods, or like especially with the USDA, it's with their satellite imagery, it's just updated technology, better technology, makes things, you know, appear different. And then we don't want to bias when collecting and analyzing data. A lot of times I run into issues with jurisdictions want to kind of ignore their weaknesses and create the comp plan as a uh, like a marketing opportunity for their community or county. But obviously we want every all strengths and weaknesses addressed in the comp plans of the data. We don't want anything left out. And then there are data limitations. That there's probably a lot of ideas you have for include or addressing the comp plan, but the data is not out there, or it would take years and years to obtain the data, a lot of time to get the data that you want. And then just a general point: we're not going to target individual property owners. We, you know, think comprehensively, comprehensively, and how to protect and enhance the general public health, safety, and welfare while not infringing on property rights. Similar zoning. Bit. And zoning, you are addressing certain parcels and comp plan. We will not be discussing parcel at all. It's just think of, like I said before, the county comprehensive. And then in regards to Worth County and other uh, planning, Winworth Beco should have strategic planning that's not usually not uh, given out to the public. They kind of keep it privately because private they're competing against other counties in their economic development. And then but fortunately, they do have a partnership with Winworth Beco, but it's uh, those two counties competing in Thurgood County, you know, Hancock County. And then uh, Winworth Beco falls underneath the Central Alliance. They have their other studies plans. This is labor shed analysis. And then Worth County does have a multi jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. There's some things that does well that comp plans don't do well. And there's a lot of things comp plans do well that hazard mitigation plans don't do well. But it's kind of the move, the planning field is moving where you, in the direction where there will be a lot of overlap between the hazard mitigation plan and the comp plan, you know, addressing uh, natural hazards like flooding and drought, uh, wind storms, extreme heat, extreme uh, cold. And Silver County is trying to combine the hazard mitigation plan and future planning into the comp plan. So just so it's more efficient government, there's just not much overlap. And then uh, we'll talk about later with the watershed management planning. They have uh, currently have the upper cedar Plan. Shell Rock is in progress, and then the Winnebago that includes uh, Clear Lake and Mason City. Which Clear Lake is Mason City would take the lead on. And then NICOG, my AC, does the long range transportation plan and the uh, comprehensive economic development strategy for the economic development administration just for funding for the region. So basically, I like that you guys are being proactive, that Jeff's taking lead on this, getting this done. And a lot of times, counties will just take the plan. And they don't change anything. They don't think critically. They just update the boxes. They're just not really doing much. They're not addressing all the changes in the methods and the data and sources out there. Similar to what I addressed earlier with all the different sources that are now there that weren't. When the Worth County adopted plan in 20, 2007, 2006, whenever, all those sources did not exist. And there was the technology wasn't great. And then I like to say, it's just an ongoing process to update the data. You don't want to let the plan gather dust. You just want it, you know, have it in the back of your mind. As a planning and zoning member, you should, you know, be aware of it. I mean, look at it at least once a year. 
And then this is just a quick list of the draft, uh, tools for drafting and implementing the comp plan. My favorite tools are geographic information systems just for the mapping and then Excel just to do the quick calculations, make the charts. And then what you guys will be doing later on is just the uh, drafting a future land use map, which is somewhat similar to zoning, but not it's more of a detailed approach to the mapping of what you want to see the county in the future. So that's be compatible with zoning. Which a lot of times zoning will say, you know, certain areas ag, but then the future land use map can potentially say it's commercial or residential. And then I'm not an expert in urban renewal and TIF. There's a lot of discussion about that, especially around the Manly area, but that's on the state code, that's another requirement to have up to date comp plan in order to have urban renewal and TIF implemented. And like I said before, you just want a user friendly document at a sixth to 10th grade reading level. So, the first thing I want to talk about is there's various different defini definitions of rural and there's a lot of opportunities and threats for a rural community and a lot of that's out of your control, it's out of the county staff's control, it's out of the supervisor's control. So and comp plan is just to be aware of where uh, rural Iowa, the rural Midwest is heading. But there, like I'm saying, there's different uh, definitions of what rural is. So I will say extension will say any county with no urban center under 10,000 residents and then you get U.S. Census Bureau says uh, Worth County is part of the Mesa City Statistical Metropolitan Area and that is not a rural county. So basically for the comprehensive plan, I, this is my opinion, to treat Worth County rural, obviously, and then but also to compare trends in Mason City to rural County. So it can be thought what happens in the Mason City to rural County, the economy does affect Worth County. And this, just for the presentation, I'll go through a lot of information. A lot of it I have gathered, but I haven't uh, presented the, uh, what do you call it, visual purposes. And then how I have uh, charts, tables, graphs formatted here, maps will be formatted differently for you know a letter size and half by 11 documents. So there'll be a few changes. But first off, we'll just chart, uh, talk briefly about the change in residence and farm operations, and then go to the land characteristics. So historically, what Worth County was before human settlement, and then what the current uh, land cover is. And then we'll just get briefly into labor force, workforce, and commies. And that's where uh, there's a lot of information out there. I haven't plugged it all in yet, but eventually you guys are wanting that. And then, uh, like I said before, NICOG does the regional transportation plan. We update that every five years for the DOT, which requires it for the Federal Highway Administration in order for Worth County to get road uh, money. So we'll talk about that last. So here is the population change. So it had a pretty steep decline uh, from 1940 to 1970, and then kind of the Worth County population stabilized. And then during the farm crisis in 1980, we'll talk about that later, 1990 it decreased, and then since 1990 it's been a steady decline. And then uh, through the previous uh, chart with all the, from the population from 1900 to 2020, I created the exponential equation. That's what fits the population best. And then through that, I projected the continued decline. So by 2060, Worth County will have from 2020 to 2060, a 12.6% decrease. You may think that looks bad, but that's not as bad as some of the towns will so the county overall is not that bad. Northwood's been growing in population. You have certain townships that have been growing in population, but you may not want a bunch of development in rural. You want farmland preservation, but you also don't want to be losing population. So we call it a, you know, rural preservation. You want to stabilize your population. So here's the population change comparison. So rural county is not as bad as Cerro Gordo County. Mason City lost 700 people. The towns around Mason City, even through Lake, have been declining population. And so it's about 2% greater for uh, decline for Silver County. But then Iowa, the metropolitan areas, which is pretty obvious for some, has been growing. And we'll talk about why they've been growing. And then I did put a little note on the bottom of all the information we want to include. And this can be on the township level and countywide. And then it's just household types. Uh, Average household size changes from uh, 2010 to 2019. The number of units, the occupancy rate, type, age, rental costs, and values, housing values. Then we get into the median age. Worth County in 2000 was a little bit older than Silver County, but now that has changed. 
And uh, they both have gotten older while Iowa has gotten younger. And then I will provide for your analysis the uh, age distribution. So the percent of the population is you know, under 18, you know, children, elderly, uh, work age. And then here is population clients. So we see uh, I have unincorporated areas, so I had to take out the uh, cities. And uh, with the sense of how it's built or provides to the public, I had to combine uh, Fertile Township and Danville since Tamlin Town sitting in the middle. And but the Danville side has seen more population increase than the Fertile side for townships. And then so the Fertile and Danville townships combine Grove Township where Northwood is and then Heartland Township. Uh, where the casino is have had the greatest uh, population increase. And then obviously, like I said, Northwood increasing the biggest decreases have been fertile and grafted. And then Joyce has been pretty stable. Manley's had a slight decrease and Kansas a slight decrease and Hamlin Town a slight decrease. And here's the farm operation. So uh, consolidation of farms, uh, Worth County has had a slightly higher decrease than uh, North Central District, and that includes the uh, counties of Nyacog Service Area, plus Humboldt, Butler County, and Wright Counties, which I do not represent. And then Iowa has had a similar decrease. And then here's just the overall change in the operations. We have the cattle operations with milk at a 66% decrease about, while the average farms operation size has increased from 1997 to 2017. And then the only increase, it's been, chicken operations have been pretty small. It, it's been a 500% increase in the chicken operations. But the biggest decrease has been in oats operations. We'll talk about land use or cover later. And then uh, the new thing they target is USDA certified organic operations. So cause the population decline that first started in the 1980s with the uh, inflation, farmers' debt lows, drop of farm values, U.S. export decline, drought, and high oil prices. And, you know, these things come and grow, though. And then uh, young people in general like to go to larger areas, metropolitan areas, for the attractions and opportunities and jar jobs. And then simply speaking, farm operations require le less, uh, where is that wrong, but uh, less uh, manpower, and then uh, added two lines combined. And then there's this lack of immigration from minorities. I'm working in the city of Hampton, they've had an increase in minorities, so there is in certain other parts of Iowa where you have increased Hispanic uh, populations, but otherwise the existing population has been leaving. Then just overall nationally decreased fertility rate in smaller families. There is a lot of evidence of decline in U.S. average life expectancy, expectancy and premature death. And this is with the increased rates of obesity, cancer, heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure, and diabetes. And just as the training I had earlier, we just have uh, the uh, U.S. University of Iowa's Rural Center for Health or similar organizations working on tackling that issue. And then the uh, environmental and occupational health aspects. And then for population increase, we have uh, Minnesota State, State Extension is really good at talking about the brain gain. They're primarily uh, younger people, people outside of uh, high school, college, are leaving. And then it's the 30 to 49 year olds with young families are going back to rural Iowa, rural America, away from larger cities just for safety and security, affordable housing, outdoor recreation, quality schools, and then simpler life without traffic and long lines. And then you also get into kind of that biggest little farm phenomena, you know, the movie on, on TV. And then this agroecology, that's attracting them to the rural lifestyle. And then uh, now we're going to jump to the historic land use. So historically speaking, uh, Worth County was the Prairie Pothole region, which in the potholes are one acre, less than one acre, depressions filled with rainfall or snowmelt. They recharge groundwater supplies. They slow and store water, uh, floodwaters. And then they support 50% of migratory water, waterfall for feeding and nesting. The Ducks Unlimited does call it the number one duck factor in North America. So you can kind of see the outline there. It does cover all of Worth County. There was a political network called the Plains of Prairie Pothole. You might look at a map of uh, a Prairie Pothole and only shows part of Worth County, but that was an attempt by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service back in 2012 or 2013 to start a kind of a political network or uh, 
network to provide resources to local communities and farmers. And then the other half in that network, the other half of Worth County was Eastern Tall Grass and Big Rivers. And then uh, also another network that just popped up to me earlier today during a training was ISU has a science-based trials so of grow crops integrated with prairie strips. So I don't know much about that, but it's the new, relatively new effort by Iowa State. And then uh, speaking of the glaciation, Worth County is split between the Des Moines Lobe and Iowa Iowan surface. So Des Moines Lobe has loamy till with no lows, and then the Iowa surface does have lows, which is a you know, like thin, wind-blown material, rich uh, nutrient material above on top of the soil. And historically, the Des Moines Lobe side, so I'll show the maps later, has been uh, blue stem prairie, and then the Iowa surface side has been blue stem prairie and oak hickory forest, which is 46 of Iowa's current woodlands, and then only one-third of these woodlands have adequate ability to regenerate. And then uh, on the Des Moines lobe there, it does say in uh, stream network poorly developed and widely spaced, incomplete surface drainage, low spots of poorly drained soils, and glacial erratics with boulders, rocks, or impediments <laughs> to agricultural productivity. And then here's the two maps. So we have on the left side, the Des Moines lobe and Iowa surface, so you see the townships where they divide. And then on the I was talking about the political networks of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's the uh, currently inactive, but it could pop up again. You see it uh, basically goes up Heartland, Brookfield, Danville. So kind of the theme, Worth County is kind of two different worlds in a sense. So you have to, you know, split by I-35, split by the eastern telegraph and Big Rivers, split Plains, and then uh, split by the Des Moines Low and Iowa, Iowa and Surface. And then uh, one of the important things we want to talk about is the soil quality. And uh, here from the Department of uh, DNR, Iowa DNR, we have the alluvial deposits. So that's the material deposited by rivers and streams. It's supposed to be some of the most fertile soil there is. It's not automatically the best for certain crops like corn. We'll talk about you know corn suitability later. But it's rich in organic materials for whatever you know, wetlands and whatever purposes. And then here is corn suitability map. So I should have had the alluvial deposits and the corn suitability map uh, side by side, but here's what the USDA has map, or I have map that I use their data for it. So I have uh, the green areas, the 80 to 100 corn suitability rating. And then next we have 60 to 79 and then the 40 to 59. I could even you know, analyze it further and symbolize it as you know, 95 to 100, 90 to 95. But you can see there's a large amount of white area. This means that USDA has not provided a corn suitability rating two yet, but the area north of Kansas is considered fertile soil. That just doesn't have the uh, rating, the value for corn suitability rating applied yet. So here's just a brief, uh, I'm not gonna go in depth, but how uh, corn suitability rating is analyzed. It's not basically a value for soil quality. That's based on the farmer's you know, levels of, of skill level, machinery, day-to-day -day operations, you know, amount of organic material they put back in the soil. And it's based more on just the, you know, whether it's sand, clay, and silt, or the combination of that, and, you know, how it prevents or affects slope and flooding, ponding, erosion. And then so, so, uh, corn suitability rating two assumes natural rainfall and no irrigation. Artificial drainage has been installed where, where required, no land level and terracing, and then adequate level of management, so not high level. So often uh, county assessors and farm management companies will revert back to CSR for long range planning. I highly recommend to ignore CSR and not use it, but just basically put CSR to not recorded and then wait on that being recorded for your long range planning. And then, like I said before, you can revert back to alluvial deposits where it is, you know, alluvial deposits not in the flood zone, that is quality soil. And then the corn suitability rating two was developed based on higher rainfall from 1981 to 2010. When it was originally developed, in the original corn suitability rating was developed in the 1970s, was based on lower rainfall in 1931 to 1950. So we have, so right now, 
percent of the county's uh, land is classified as classified with the corn suitability rating too. And then I have all the different types of soils there. And then I'll go to the next page. This is for display purposes, not to look at it. I'm not expecting all of you to read or be able to see it. But here's a list of all the soils that currently do not have a corn suitability rating two yet. And some of them just may have a zero. So there are two at the top that do have a zero. So they definitely do have a rating. It's not great soil. And this is 41.9% of the county's area so far. And then we're going to the uh, watershed. So there's a lot of effort in the state of Iowa to have watershed planning and sub watershed planning. And so there's been a lot of efforts happening in Floyd County uh, to the east with the Upper Cedar and then the Shell Rock is uh, starting their planning. And then Mason City has hinted at wanting to do things. Fluid has uh, hired their uh, pure water, their water coordinator. And Mason City wants to do Willow Creek efforts but foremost they should be starting you know, efforts to for watershed planning so it's not expectation that we're county should take a lead in this but you know be you know a partner in the discussions for the watershed management and then here's just the zoomed in township so the orange boundaries are subunits sub watersheds there's even one between watersheds we talked about on the other slide and the orange boundaries and then you can see which uh, watersheds are in which, which township. And then I do have the, I did not label the streams, but I do have all the streams and then the 100 year floods. So it says 1% chance of flooding, but that is still, according to FEMA, still highly likely to flood. And then uh, an item that should be in discussion is sinkholes. Worth County is not in as, uh, has as much high risk area as you would find in Eastern Iowa or even in Floyd County or Mitchell. But there are uh, various sinkholes reported around the, primarily the uh, Eastern side of Worth County. And these could be, you know, currently, you know, mantle with soil material, so they're filled in or they're either open, but there are a lot of issues that cause sinkholes to form. And uh, once they are formed, they can, you know, surface runoff and get into groundwater. So, it is a significant issue that Worth County should address in this complex. And I don't remember if it did in the, the original complex. And then here, I'm not expecting to read all of it, but I did a pretty exhaustive analysis of the land change cover using the uh, USDA's uh, cropscape but raster data. And so there's a lot of tug and war between you know, the cropland with soybean and corn and then uh, grassland pasture and wetlands. So later I'll talk about the uh, inventory of wetlands by US Fish and Wildlife Service, but then satellite imagery and the ground truth methods the uh, USDA uses, they do uh, you know, consider other area wetlands. You can consider a dish on the side of the road a wetland. So there's been a lot of changes. So you can see uh, go along uh, grassland pasture. For most, most townships, it's uh, decreased except for uh, Silver Lake. And then with the uh, corn, it's increased from most places except for uh, Silver Lake from 2010 to 2020. And then in Brookfield Township, it slightly decreased from 2010 to 2020. And then all the blue numbers are just where it stabilized. There was no change between you know, 2000 and 2020 or 2010 and 2020. And then I'll give the next six townships on the next slide. And then, so here again, you have uh, so most of these forgot to make one mark one red, but a decrease in grassland pasture in all of these townships, and then a decrease in corn in Grove, and then an increase, and then decrease in Deer Creek from 2010 to 2020, and then an increase elsewhere. So I can uh, always email this, and you guys can put it on your shared drive to look at it on your own. And also, I want to say uh, we can do individual maps, so we can create a map of just the. Uh, you know, corn or just soybeans in a uh, developed area. One thing I didn't talk about was developed areas. So each township, you do see a small percentage of increased development, which is, and then the data from 2020 was not great. It does primarily rely on satellite imagery in 2020 or 20, 2000 wasn't great. And then, you know, it got a little bit better in 2010 and then it's getting pretty good right now in 2020. So the 2010 to 2020 number, is just easier data, better to use. And, 2000. So there's a lot of missing information for uh, 
2000. Just the data did not make sense. Then let's talk briefly about the soybean yield is maybe data you already seen before. But uh, basically when you know, say Iowa, North Central region increases, North County increases, and then there's a lot of factors that affect soybean. And I know there's, I'm not a farmer, I know there's ongoing discussion about whether or not to apply nitrogen to soybeans to increase yield when uh, soybeans are nitrogen fixing uh, plants. And like uh, before I was talking about the county hazard mitigation plan, there should be in your, your comp plan, uh, not uh, that you have to have the county you know, actively address it, but you should uh, acknowledge drought and crop disease and how that could severely affect the economy of the county and the local residents. And uh, just one source learned about today was for climate variability. I don't, I don't think climate change is the best word, but climate variability just monitoring is conducted by USDA Midwest Climate Hub and Dean. So that's a good uh, source for me, for you to look at for further information. And then corn yield basically is similar, you know, soybeans when it's increased North Central region, Iowa, it's increased in Worth County. And here's the average farmland value. So basically there's one point, so it have been 2017 to 2018, farm price increased in Worth County while they decreased slightly in uh, North Central region and Iowa. But otherwise they've kind of followed a similar pattern. And then uh, Worth County is a little less than average farm value per acre than uh, in Iowa and then uh, North Central region is a little bit higher than Worth County. And then uh, in 2021, they did provide a uh, corn suitability rating. So they were trying to uh, differentiate between high quality land, medium quality, and low quality. So high quality has an 85 CSR2, medium quality has 75 CSR2, and then low quality is 61 CSR2. And then here is the uh, difference in the wetlands talked about earlier. This is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, inventory of wetlands, so where they believe is you know official wetland area. So you can see they're more on the uh, north uh, the Silver Lake there, and then you know, around Joyce, north uh, west of Joyce, in the uh, northwest side of the county. And then just briefly, conservation area that you all are, might be pretty much aware of, but basically the comp plan you know what should address you know description of each conservation area, which is often just counting and pasting, copying and pasting from the county conservation board. And then it's kind of a cartoonish map, but I just did this for display purposes, just to show the wind turbines, which you all probably have seen current turbines. And then there's a lot of uh, factors that the county finds important, the public, and then a lot of factors that the turbine company developers find important, you know, constraints associated with communication signals, microwave link corridors, radar, turbine minimum spacing. So uh, one opportunity for the county is to do, and it's not me, you know, to find services through Iowa State University of Iowa do a suitability analysis that shows where the county's preferred locations are for wind turbines. So basically it's plugging in all the data layers and then you give a higher weight to certain layers for like you know setbacks from houses or environmental constraints and then it you know provides analysis of uh, where the best areas are. And then briefly I'll talk about the uh, economy uh, items which I have not gotten in all the details yet, but the items are just percent living below federal poverty level, percent receiving food stamps, SNAP, household income, household earning types, uh, be pr include percent of households receiving each type, employment, earning, social security, retirement income, and supplemental. I don't think I have finished it all, but uh, SSI. And then uh, we have percent of household income towards rent, households renting, and then percent of household income towards mortgage. And then uh, we needed, uh, this is countywide data. It's important for the supervisors and counties still know it does, you know, take into account the cities, but you want to differentiate between the labor force, that is the residents of Worth County that are looking for work, or currently working in and outside of Worth County. And then the workforce are residents who work within uh, Worth County that could be living outside the county. And so you'd want, I have the unemployment rate, I didn't put all this in the presentation, but the unemployment rate trends. Uh, percent within the labor force, percent within the five types of occupations provided by U.S. Census, the percent within the 13 types of industries, 
so let's see which industries in Worth County are you know have the highest percentages. And then direction, location of employment, commute time, and distance to work for Worth County's uh, residents within the labor forces. And then to the workforce, we uh, added a little information about the jobs. These are estimated jobs. It may not be the actual amounts, but the changes. So Worth County had a pretty big, uh, significant increase, especially compared to Worth or Silver County and state of Iowa from 20, 2002 to 2019, and then a very small increase from 2010 to 2019. Whereas uh, Silver County, Mesa City, Clear Lake has not done as well. And then uh, just provide, I have easily can provide uh, countywide transit estimates for place of residence for county workers and then di direction of distance from work to home. So when they're working in Worth County, which direction are they leaving to go? So are they going to Mesa City, Minnesota, you know, Mitchell County, uh, Winnebago? And here's just another quick table. So. This is for uh, for the jobs analysis. So you have employed in Worth County, but living outside, you have that. The difference was uh, from 2002 to 2019, 3.3 percent. And then you have employed and living in Worth County. The number of people who are employed and living in Worth County has changed by you know percentage. The total population 9.6 percent percentage difference now. And then living in Worth County but employed outside has increased slightly by 2.9. And then uh, just education, we don't want to get too much into the school districts, but we do want to talk about the educational attainment of population 25 years and older, and then the median employment earnings of population 25 years and older for each level of educational attainment. And then before I get to transportation, I just want to talk about retail briefly. The ISU Department of Economics provides a lot of information, but basically you want to analyze the retail sales per capita versus expected sales per capita. I'll create a chart graphs for that. But the county, Worth County as expected does uh, or falls within the range for uh, comparing to pure communities. So other counties in Iowa that are in similar situations, Worth County, they are have their expected sales. But you get the trade surplus or leakage and trade capture area, Worth County is competing against Mason City, Austin, Albert Lee. So Worth County does have a significant leakage to nearby communities for uh, the trade and then the trade capture area is significantly below the uh, county's population, which means the trade area has been consumed by nearby counties. And then uh, these are maps. I'm going to change the format. You know, you're from where county, you know where county is. You don't need the inset that shows where your county is uh, within Iowa. So basically, I'll just change that up. Uh, for formatting purposes, we don't want relatively large titles on the maps. We want you to be able to write the title on the figure number when you're inserting it into the plan. So I'll talk about each one of these briefly and then that will be the end. So we have uh, Bruce's sufficiency data. Right now I have uh, have data from I believe up till 2020. So it's 2022 now. We do have a pretty good uh, date for Iowa Department of Transportation. So I'll check on more updated uh, information. Then I put the Bruce sufficiency data on top of the Average annual daily traffic so shows which roads are most heavily traveled. So, right now, the insufficient, the bridges that are not so good are on roads that are not traveled well. But it is good for the county to address the, uh, in the engineering department if they haven't already been bringing it to your attention. I can bring it to your attention. And then we have the report of crash history. So, the fatalities, major injuries, and minor injuries. I have the data from. 2009 to 2020, we can probably start getting the 2021 data. And uh, then I have the federal classification of roads. So we have interstate, minor arterial, major collector, minor collector, and local roads. And then here's a, a map of the pavement condition and international rough, roughness index. So basically, uh, what engineers use to decide you know, whether or not to repair roads. So looking at the map, Worth County, the county roads, they, you know, interstate, state of Iowa, it's not bad. And then the bad roads are in cities. That's not, for our purposes, that's not our uh, issue. So it's just, a, you know, a you know, way to prioritize your roads. The ones that overlap, overlap with the higher travel roads, you know, obviously you fix those first. And then on the right side, I just have the multi-use recreational trails, proposed trails, so not programmed or existing trails. We do have existing trails in Northwood, but 
otherwise not much in Worth County, but just for outdoor recreation, tourism, just for your residents, quality of life, it is good to address uh, trails. Most times county engineers do not, for safety reasons, don't want trails, but it's just, it's planning zoning to address uh, the public's desire for trails. So I will take any questions. I kind of went through that fast, but it's just trying uh, to stimulate your mind and get you thinking. Any questions for Matt? So, um, once again, for everybody, the uh, all the stuff that Matt just went through, it's just it's work in progress right now. Uh, but that's the kind of information that is in the front part of the countywide development plan. Um, and <clears throat> once we have, you know, once Matt's got that stuff, and then we'll have to collect some other, uh, some other information from the county as well. Um, that that will be made. That will provide the update to the first of the plan. And we're going to have to go through and assess all of that information and digest that, and use that in conjunction with the information we get on the goals, the grading of the goals, to come up with our recommendation. Lost you. This stated countywide development plan. So, um, <laughs> just got a big echo. Is that? Hello? Nope, no more echo. Sorry. Okay. All right, that's all right. Um, so without going into questions on the detail of it, because again, this is all work in progress and Matt's gonna have to um, continue work on that to update that information. Um, do you guys, anybody have questions on the approach that we're taking with Matt trying to get this information updated? Was there anything glaring that stuck out at you that you, you thought um, we shouldn't really need to consider that or well, I didn't hear about XYZ. I think we're going to be missing information on something. Yeah, one of the one of the things that I'd mentioned early on when we talked about this was uh, maybe the need or the curiosity of Worth County land ownership. Who owns it? Who doesn't? Residents versus non-residents, farming, government owned acres. Um, ages of the landowners, just data on who actually owns the property in Worth County. <clears throat> Matt, is that something that? Um... Yeah, I think that that's. I think that would be good. Just you know, government versus I'm trying to think of the best way to do it, but there should be a way to, you know, address that in the plan. Right, because that's you know that's something that's probably changing. You know, the, the age of our landowners is one thing, but who is actively farming their own ground, who's rented out. But mostly the question originally was, you know, how many residents of Worth County own Worth County ground versus non-residents of Worth County, or you follow me? Mm. So yeah, I think there yeah, might ask the assessor's office, I kind of, there should be a way around it's just, you have to get find the right person to give us the information we want. So, yeah, I'll look into that. Okay. Anybody else have anything for this kind of data? Okay. Well, um, again, thanks, Matt, and. Uh, Matt said he'll send a, a copy of this, so I will post it on the um, on the, the shared drive. Uh, in fact, speaking of shared drive, let me share my screen here. So I'll add that um, into this development plan documents shared drive. And um, Elliot and Bill, have you 
have you guys um have you got anything via email that told you that you have access to this drive now you should have gotten an email saying that you've got access to it you're muted sorry about that yeah i've got that okay I haven't had a chance to look at anything yet yeah yeah, yeah. No, I just want to make sure you got the you got an email saying that you have access to it. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll, we'll get the um, uh, that presentation that Matt gave. We'll get that posted out there. Um, and then I think I don't think. Oh, I have one uh, one other question for you, Matt. Um, we're getting ready to to talk about um, assessing the goals from the 2006 plan, and one of the things that um, we had discussed in in preliminary conversations was doing a um, uh, an online survey for county residents or mailing survey. Are either one of those things something that um, uh, that that you guys at NICOG can help us with? Yeah, we don't, we usually don't work with mailing surveys, but I mean, what we can do is with SurveyMonkey, you create the survey. So we can uh, give you a template to work off of, and then US P and Z, you know, modify it for what you want. And then we, you know, let's create that in uh, SurveyMonkey again, and then, you know, give you the web link, and then we can also do a printed copy for anyone who needs it mailed to us. So it's a pretty easy thing to do. It's just, uh, I'll create a template and just set it your guys' way, and you can you know, work off of that. Or if you already have okay. ideas well, what you want for questions, just send them my way and I can plug it in SurveyMonkey. So yeah. NICOG does have a SurveyMonkey account. Yeah, so what we have, um, and again, this is this is out there on the shared drive. There's a goal questionnaire document. And in that document, um, it gives information on the, um, uh, you know what what the the rating scale is, and it's got some draft language that we would include with the survey. But what we've done is we've gone through um, the existing you know the 2006 development plan that laid out all of the various goals, and they've got them divided up into um, well, like you see on the the screen here. Um, land use planning uh, was a section and they had several goals that were listed there that are quoted here. So one was guide basic land use patterns and the incremental land use decisions made for the county and protect individual property rights, blah, blah, blah. Um, so these five um, goals were laid out in the plan underneath, underneath land use planning. And then there was a section titled agriculture and farming and, and so on and so forth. So there's all these sections in the plan and we've got the goals. So one of the things that we wanna do is um, have very broad participation uh, input into assessing well, how well has the county performed against each of these goals over the last 15 years. And that's the agenda item that we need to discuss now is how do we go about getting that broad input from across the county? Our thoughts, preliminary thoughts were we could give the questionnaire to each of the county officials. So all the county supervisors, um, the, the auditor, et cetera, um, all the different offices and ask them to assess the goals from their position. We would specifically reach out to all of the people that are around that were um, participants in developing the plan in 2005, we know who they are. They're listed on the front of the plan. And then the rest of it is 
surveys, uh, online survey. It's easy enough to create an online survey, but not everybody's going to take the time to log on and click through these, you know, however many questions are, are in this thing. You know, there's a lot. Um, but these were all the goals that the county laid out. So I think it's appropriate to assess how well the county has done because that, that should give us input into what we want to do going forward. Um, you know, do we not do an online survey? Do we do a mailing survey? Do we do, you know, some of each? How do we, what are people's thoughts on how do we get the broadest participation in this first step of assessing the goals? Any thoughts at all from anybody? Can we say anything? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I guess we think a mail-in survey, but be nice when you when the government does a federal survey and they keep track who returns the survey, you know, and who, so you know how many people did do it and you send out another one or, or not, or you keep sending them out until they send it back. Just a thought, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, one of my thoughts was, first of all, I think some people are gonna be more inclined to do online than paper. And some people are going to be more inclined to do paper than online. I think we're going to have a mixture. Um, some people we know are not online. They, they, they don't have internet. Um, so one of the things I thought of is, well, what if we did a mailing to everybody? So countywide, we do a mailing of the survey, but on the survey, we tell them if they prefer to do it online, they can do so online instead of filling out the paper and sending it back to us. So we would have both available. Um, even then, it's questionable how much uh, participation that we're actually going to get. You know, one of the suggestions from a couple of months ago was, well, maybe we have... Um, Town hall meetings, you know, we we take the um, the county and we just we strike the county vertically, and we capture you know these three townships. We have a a public meeting for these three townships to come together, and you know then we do another one and another one and another one and another one. Um, the challenge there is again, I don't know how many goals there are on here, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pages of um, these goals. Now, they're not huge pages, but you know, there's let's say five or six goals per page. So, I mean, do the math. That's that's a lot of questions to try to go through and get input from everybody in a town hall. So I'm not certain how, how something like that would work, but um, yeah, I mean, other than survey, I'm not sure what else we can do. What have you seen other counties do, Matt? Oh, well, for usually for counties in the past, they've uh, have mailed it out to residents to try to get input. But I mean, that's that's most of the counties in North Iowa region has you know have done it ten years ago or more, similar to Worth County when the survey you know not as many people had smartphones. So I 
I do think it's a good effort to try to do the uh, online way. And then you can send the letter to you know, the residents of townships, but you have a QR code where they can just scan that with their phone if they do have a smartphone or internet, and then it pulls up the survey right away so they don't have to type in the link. So a lot of people, and they have to type in a link, they're not going to do it, but if it pops up all of a sudden out with the QR code, they'll fill it out. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of certain people needing a paper copy where they're not able to, you know, they don't have a smartphone or they don't have the internet. Okay. But yeah, most, I work more with the cities. I mean, there's so many more cities. They're, uh, you know, a hybrid method. So they have it at, you know, you don't have the op opportunity in an unincorporated area, but they'll put it at the library and take them to the nursing homes, they take them to the schools, give them home the give them the kids to give to their uh, parents. So it's just in the townships, you, you know, it's less people. So you just have to kind of go to them. I don't just find that meeting place. Right. You just don't want to get input, you know, from the cities have them. I mean, you could, but you could have a question on the survey that says, do you live in one of the cities or an unincorporated area? And then you can filter out you can still get the input of individuals in the cities, but then you can filter them out and just analyze the input from individuals in unincorporated areas. So there's a lot of fun or you know easy tools with SurveyMonkey. It's just easy stuff to do. Okay. Uh so how do we get the word out to people effectively that this is what we're trying to do, you know, expect the survey and so on, you know, outside of just public notice in the paper, because that, that doesn't seem to get to very many people sometimes. Is that really all that we have available? Just put notice in the paper. Here's what we're trying to do. How about does any counties use like a county website to get notice out to people or don't they do that? Like an agenda or, or not an agenda, but just be a word is just saying hey this is going to be coming out to let people notice on a county website or is that possible or not or well we would certainly have the information on the planning and zoning page uh portion of the county website but i don't the county doesn't really have an announcement section i maybe talk to joel about putting something like that out there. I don't know if timing is, is relative for it, but a lot of this comes down to landowners and residents and they're all gonna have property taxes. I don't know if a notice can go in either online or hard mailed with their property taxes, notices. Hmm. That'd be a good one. That would take longer. You know when I mean, that's quarterly. you know when those are mailed out though? It seems to me I thought taxes are due in March and September, right? Right, that that's the issue. I mean, that turns into kind of a long, longer time frame than what we maybe have right now. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't remember when I get the taxes. I'll talk to Cindy and see if there's. I think that's August. Yeah, you're not going to get them till August. Oh, okay. So it comes out in August for September and the following March. Yep. Correct. First and second tab were in the August mailing. Okay. 
All right. Any other thoughts on how we get the word out to folks that this effort's underway and we really would like your input and participation? Pretty hard time getting much participation, no matter how we do it. Yeah. Okay. My opinion, I guess the best way is do the mailing and like Matt said, put a QR code on it and they can either mail it back or do it on the internet. Yep. Okay. Uh, it's the only surefire way of getting everybody a chance. Right. Uh, maybe I'll talk to uh, I'll talk to Jackie and Cindy too and see if there's a way that we can filter out um, well Matt for our for our surveys you had talked about filtering city residences versus unincorporated area residences yeah it's not very much of, that's pretty do, easy to do okay but for the purposes of assessing the goals do you think we, we need to do that filtering to make that distinction or i mean you don't you don't have to do it it's just if you wanted to do that so i'll, I'll have cities okay. especially since cities are what i'm working with that you know they have the workers going in so you have employers giving the surveys out and you get, you're getting non-residents to fill it out and the city wants, you know, for certain things, just to know what the residents want and not, the, you know, just the workers coming right. into the city. We would still want, I mean, their input's still important. It's, it's, yep. it's a small county. We still want their ideas and their thoughts, but it might be relative to know whether they're from town or not. Yeah, okay. Because I was just thinking, if 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 we if the intent was to filter them out, then I was going to see if there's a way just to filter out the mailing, because that would help cut down the the costs as well. But if we're going to consider input from city residences as well as areas of the unincorporated areas, then. But well, to me, this is such everybody. A county that's basically rural. You've got a lot of farmers and landowners that live in town with an in town address. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's a small, small county. It's, you know, we don't have Dallas, Texas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any other discussion? on that then, on um, the approach for grading the goals. Okay. So um, if not then, so what I have as um, tenant to do is Matt is gonna continue work on the um, state of the county stuff. He's going to send us a copy of the slide deck. I will post it on the shared drive. Um, we'll have another zoning meeting next Wednesday. I'll get a um, uh, an agenda out for everybody, uh, but it will be for, um, whoops, not there. It'll be for you guys digesting the information that's in this document. Uh, so we can um, this, agree on an approach. There's an approach listed in there. We can certainly doctor that. Um, and then from that, I'll give that information to Matt so that Matt can then make um, initial proposed zoning assignments across the townships that are not zoned um, and 
we will also next week uh, establish the date of the first public hearing with regard to countywide zoning. That first public hearing uh, is really not so much a public hearing as a public meeting at a more convenient time for uh, for the general population where we can get whoever wants to show up in a room and explain to them the process that the zoning commission is going to go through to ultimately come up with recommendations to give to the county supervisors. Um, we have the goal questionnaire that has already been created. Um, I'll work with Matt to get um, online survey created for that. I'll work, I'll draft up a letter and work with Jackie um, to be able to get a survey put together, essentially what we have here on the screen and uh, get a QR code for the online survey and get that mailed out to folks. And we'll try to get that stuff um, done and mailed out uh, in the coming weeks. And then we want to give, we, we had talked about um, giving a 30 day window on gathering the survey information. Any thoughts on that? Adjustments to that? Once we get the survey out, have a 30 day window for us to close the survey and say, we got what we got. Okay, we'll start that 30 day clock once we get the mailing out then. And once we get that data, then we'll move on to, um, to our next steps then. of evaluating those results. And hopefully by then, Matt will be done with the rest of the current state. So, did I miss anything on what should be coming up for the next steps? Nope. Okay, does anybody want to get out of here tonight? Motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs>